there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And we just pray that uh, uh, someone would get saved here today, or, or more than someone. Uh, Lord, we think of uh, some of these folks that are written down here on our, our prayer list, as well as others who have been who have just been uh, given to me. Uh, we pray, uh, Dawn gave me a little note here saying to uh, pray for a young man named Connor uh, playing football yesterday and uh, he got hit in the spine and uh, he's, uh, uh, he's, he just needs prayer uh, right now, Lord. And uh, so we just pray that your hand would be upon him and uh, Lord, if he's not saved, if his family's not saved, then may they come to Christ during this time, uh, this difficult time for him and them. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, those many, uh, just millions of people who have been affected by uh, the latest hurricane. Uh, uh, numerous people have uh, died uh, from the flood or from uh, the wind, the rain, or wh whatever. They they passed away, and so we just we pray for their families at this time also uh, that they return to you uh, at the time at their time of loss. We. Uh, uh, Lord, we just we pray for uh, Barbara Cosgrove. Uh, she's been sick now for a while and hasn't been able to be with us. And, and uh, God, we just pray that you would uh, bless her also at this time. Uh, Lord, it's uh, some that are on this list. Uh, Emery Brennan, uh, she's on uh, hospice right now. And uh, for there's some people in here that wouldn't know her or her sister Martha Pachelski, but um, uh, they. They were faithful members of our church uh, for a long time. So we just pray that you bless both of them at this time. Uh, Lord Frank Epinato, uh, he's, he's going through a rough time also. And we, uh, we pray uh, for Frank. Please uh, encourage him and bless him and, and help us to be uh, a blessing to him uh, during this time that he's, when he's laid up also. And uh, we pray for... Uh, Arlene, uh, Helena's sister, yes, uh, and she's recovering. Uh, Betty Taylor's dad uh, being hospitalized. Peggy Reeves in, uh, in rehab, uh, broke a bone in her back. And uh, so, Lord, she's in a, a lot of pain. And uh, John Butcher's brother and the Father, there are so many people uh, that need you and need your hand of blessing, whether it's health or whatever it might be. Uh, we just ask God that you would, you would uh, put your hand upon them and not only help them physically, but more importantly, Father, uh, spiritually and maybe, maybe emotionally. Um, God, we pray for each one of these people that have been brought to our attention. Uh, we, we pray, Father, for those that are dealing with ongoing health issues. Uh, we, we pray for them. Lord, we think of, uh, Karen just had a procedure done, and God, we just ask that you would help that procedure uh, that was done. We, we, we pray that that would help her and uh, JW and, and their situation. And, uh, uh, Lord, for salvation, uh, we've all got family, we've all got friends, we've all got neighbors, we've all got acquaintances, people we work with, and, and others that are in need of salvation. And uh, uh, God, I just pray that you would. Um, you would touch their hearts and many would come to Christ. But, Lord, you want to use us. And uh, so uh, help us to be usable and uh, have a desire for you to use us. Lord, we pray for our, our country. Um, again, we're one day close, one week uh, closer to an election. And, uh, Lord, uh, is, I, think, I think Pastor Randy and I, and, and I think most people in here, uh, just are, are, are going to trust you. Uh, no matter who wins this election, we're going to trust you. Father, what, what choice do we have? Not to trust you? Uh, we're not going down that road. Uh, we're going to trust you with all of our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. And we're going to direct our paths. And uh, so, Lord, we just pray that you would have your will done uh, in this uh, very important election. Uh, and not just for the White House, Father, but uh, in the Senate and the House of Representatives and governors and mayors and uh, different people. Uh, may your will uh, be done uh, in each one of their lives and in the lives and the life uh, of our country. Uh, Father, we, we uh, pray for our uh, missionaries. And uh, God, we just pray that you would bless each one of our missionaries that 
uh, both that we support and I mean there's there's missions groups uh, all over the world that are preaching and teaching the word of God and uh, God we just pray that you would continue to bless them and and uh, may they be encouraged and may they may they stay uh, they would continue to stay doing what you called them to do so please bless them Lord uh, Father we pray for our uh, our first responders, our police and firefighters and uh, ambulance people and paramedics and uh, the doctors and nurses that take care of the people that they bring in. Lord, thank you for each one of them and please bless them. I pray that many would come to Christ in the positions that they're in. Lord, we ask that you bless Pastor Randy, uh, help him to speak uh, the Word of God the way you want it spoken and uh, help our ears and our hearts to be open to hear what you have us to hear today, Lord. And, and again, may you uh, touch hearts here this morning. And uh, so uh, bless each of us for being here, Father. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Russ. Um, just a couple things. Uh, I want to... <clears throat> Beaver, did you get that working? Yes. I want to um, I want to apologize to those who are listening online. Um, we lost connection for a while. Um, they put me in charge of running the projectors this morning, and uh, <coughs> and all I know is push a button, and I pushed the button, and apparently it didn't work properly. <coughs> it came on for a little bit, went off. So for you folks who are watching at home, I apologize. You missed the uh, you missed the uh, singing. Uh, but you got the better part, which is the Word of God. So um, the, uh, just uh, thank you to, for Beaver who came running in to fix the problem. <clears throat> and uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate the help there. I, I also want to thank those who were at the uh, work day yesterday. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we, do, we did um, uh, have a, a great opportunity to do a lot of work and to be able to um, you know, clean up the church. Uh, you notice the dumpster that's outside. I know it's in the way of parking, so uh, it will be gone by tom tomorrow or Tuesday, uh, hopefully first thing tomorrow, but uh, we, uh, you know, it is full, and uh, we did get a lot of stuff removed, and, you know, thank you on behalf of the House Committee, on behalf of the uh, leadership of the church. We just want to say thank you for all. We had about 20 people here <coughs> who were willing to uh, lift things and do things, and it was just a blessing to have all that coming. Just a reminder, I know we have a couple kids that have come in. Uh, junior Church has started, so if they want to go down uh, to Junior Church at the end of the ramp, down here, uh, go out these doors and down to the end of the ramp, um, they have a program down there for them. Take your Bibles, if you will. Um, today we're going to continue part two, the Christian's responsibility toward, towards the government. <clears throat> I, I guess it was uh, last year I preached a message on the government, and I like to do that before the elections. Um, but I did that, and I did it too late. Um, you know, I believe I did it either right before the Sunday before election or right after the election. Um, and uh, this, this year I really prayed and I asked the Lord to really give me work the timing out. And so he worked it out that I could use last week and this week to preach on Romans chapter 13. And um, so if you, have your, uh, if you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 13. Uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to be looking at the Christian and his uh, responsibility towards the government. What is our responsibility towards the government? Now, last week we started this, and if you remember in <clears throat> Romans chapter 13, in verse 1, and we, we focused most of our attention on verse 1 last week, but in verse 1 it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and that the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And we talked about how God appoints and establishes authorities, and He's the one that, that, that calls all things, and we need to trust the Lord. And if you remember, I ended with that verse, you know, that, uh, that you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and not on your own understanding. You know, we, we have to understand God is in control of all circumstances. Um, so today I want us to uh, go through and I want us to uh, really recap real quick. And so the outlines I put in your bulletin, if I'm not mistaken, um, it talks about what I talked about last, last week, the facts to remember. And, uh, and if you remember, just, just for those who weren't here, just want to highlight those four facts. I mentioned there were four facts uh, that we find with regards to, um, to, the, um, uh, to this. Uh, number one, 
Um, you know, Paul was writing to believers, number two. Paul was writing to uh, all social class uh, people, you know, and we talked about that. Number three, uh, the leadership of the day was corrupt. And uh, number four, God provides and protects. Um, after we went and saw that, we started looking at point number two, which was the challenge that the Apostle Paul gave. And in verse one is that challenge. We started looking at that challenge. The first challenge was the government is to be obeyed. And the second challenge um, is that the... Um, is that the government is established by God. And I want to take a little time today, and I want to expand on both of those things before we look at my third point today, which is how does this apply to us biblically? How can we take what God says in principle here and apply it to, um, to America 2024 as we walk this earth and as we, uh, we deal with politics and as we deal with government here in our own country? So let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get, uh, we'll, we'll get into the meat of the word. Father, Lord, thank you for today. Be with us as we study your word. Help us to understand, apply, and um, that, Lord, uh, just live out the truths of your word. Lord, we want to be a lighthouse for you. We want to be a testimony for you. We want to be um, your ambassadors. And so, Lord, work in our hearts today. Use my words, enable it to be your words. Give great understanding and great application. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. And so in verse 1, we find again, and I'm going to, we find the word subject. And it's interesting, the first thing we need to understand is that government is to be obeyed. God says, listen, you need to be subject to those who are in authority over you. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 21, <coughs> uses the exact same Greek word when it talks about uh, relationships we have with one another. And in this text, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, when, when Paul's writing to the church, he says, listen, you have a responsibility within the church to be subject one to another. That's the same word he uses when he goes and writes in Romans chapter 13, and he says, listen, you need to be subject to authority. It's interesting, this word subject to authority, and I, I briefly mentioned this, but it means to be under somebody else's rule or somebody else's authority. A willingness to be under that authority. Listen, we get ourselves in trouble when we think that we are above authority. We are not. Okay? And, and there's, a, there's a great example of this. Okay, in Matthew chapter 8, and I don't want us to turn there today, but in Matthew chapter 8, in verses 8 and 9, and actually it's more than that, but in verses 8 and 9, there's a, there, there's a, there's a centurion who comes to Christ and says, Listen, uh, my, my servant is sick. And, and you need to heal him. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come to your house. He says, no, 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 you don't have to come to my house. He says, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man under subjection. I'm the man, he uses this word again. He, I'm the man under a rule and under that, 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 uh, that, uh, the authority that is given me. He says, I'm a man of authority. I will say something and it's done. He says, you're a man of authority. All you have to do is speak. And my servant is you. Okay, and, and we need to understand that this idea of being under authority. Listen to what the centurion says. He says, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And then he says this, for I am also under authority, having soldiers under me, and I, have, uh, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Okay? This idea of authority under somebody else's rule. We need to understand we are all under somebody's rule. And if it's in the church, we're under somebody's rule. If it's at work, we're under somebody's rule. If it's in, if, in, in the world, we're under somebody's rule. Wherever we are, we're under somebody's rule. Okay? We, we, the, the Word of God makes it very clear. Submitting one another, submitting to one another, this idea of we come together... Not as Lord over other people, but as equals, so we can then come and we can serve God together for the honor and glory of who? The one who is our head, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the picture we have. The problem in churches today is there's too many people who want to be heads. But the word of God says there's only one head, that's Jesus Christ. We were all perceived, and we serve the Lord. This is His ministry, not my ministry, not your ministry. 
He has entrusted us with that, and we roll up our sleeves and we work together for His honor and His glory, but there's a unity, and that's the same, and in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul goes from this verse, he goes right into the family, and he says, listen, you're a a family, there's a husband and there's a wife, and yes, the wife is is under the authority of the husband, but guess what, you're so equal, and he brings that same picture of equal. We have to understand that we come together and we work together together. That's that picture that we have under authority. We have to remember that when we talk about our government, we're under the authority of the government that God has placed over us, and we've already talked about how God established the government and so on. Okay, so uh, so the question that I have is, should we ever disobey the government? Now, last week on the way out, somebody approached me and said, what about the Revolutionary War? Was that right for those who fought against the authority that was placed over them, was that right for them to go to war? Now we have, a, we have an expert in history uh, sitting right here in the second pew, and I have to be very careful what I say, okay? I tend to think, if I, you know, I tend to think that when Jesus, when, when, when God gave Paul this text, He was talking about how dangerous it is to not have any rule over you. What I'm talking about is anarchy. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. And it's interesting, if you study the Old Testament, you find that in Judges, the children of Israel got themselves in trouble because they stopped following their leader, which was God. And the Word of God says at the end of Judges that every man did what seemed right in his own eyes. That becomes anarchy. That becomes chaos when everybody does whatever they want. Okay, and so what what I think is being taught here is God has placed authority and established authority and appointed authority. Why? So we can be under authority. Why? Because we work better when there's this system that's set up. Okay, now I tend to think that when the system, even though God says, and, and we're going to look at that real briefly here in a minute, But even though when God says, obey the system, and the system says, well, wait a minute, we don't want God in anything, we don't want God part of anything, we're going to take God out of our courts, we're going to take God out of our our schools, we're going to take God out of all these things, but we still want you to obey us, there is a place where we have to say, listen, I'm going to obey God first. And if it falls where I can obey man, but there's also consequences to that and, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at those things. So should man obey God? The Word of God in 1 Peter chapter 3, over and over again, uh, the, the, the New Testament tells us, therefore submit. There's that word again. Okay, Be under the authority. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You know what the ordinance of man is? It's the law. Submit yourself to the law. Can I say this? You're driving down 95, and the road is wide open. Now, that hardly ever happens anymore, okay? (laughs) But you're driving down 95, and the cars are passing you doing 65 miles an hour, and you say, well, I'm going to stay up with traffic. Wait a minute. The law says 55. Are you willing to obey the law every coordinates of man? Okay? Yeah, that's almost impossible. Why? Because they're going to push you off the road. Okay, But the Word of God says we need to submit to that authority that is placed before us. So where do we break that? And the, the, the pattern that I think okay, is found in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 where the apostles were told, listen, we want you to go, but we don't want you to preach the gospel anymore. And they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to obey the commandments that my God gave me. And what did God give me? the children of Israel to do, or the, the church to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You want to know a little bit more about that? Come next week. Pastor Russ is going to kick our, off our missionary conference he's looking at, where he's going to be looking at the Great Commission. Their need to go out and spread the gospel. That is our responsibility. And when the world says you can't do that, when, when the world comes in, and I tend to believe America's coming this way, and we have to be very, very careful who gets, who, 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 who's, who's in power. Okay, and I'm not 
I'm playing any political game. I'm not, I'm not you know, pushing Republican. I'm not pushing Democrat. I'm not pushing anybody in between. I'm just saying we have to be careful who's in power because I believe there's coming a day where Satan wants the church to be silent. And so Satan is trying to get people in authority and people elected who are going to say, listen, church, you cannot preach certain things. At that point, are we willing to say, we're going to draw the line, we're going to do what God wants us to do. Don't get me wrong. When we preach against sin, we need to do it in love at all times. Don't forget that. You know, it's so easy for me to get up here and I can preach against I can preach against abortion. And I can lose, you know, I can get I can get angry because you know, hey, they're murdering little kids. The word of God says, listen, they're sinners. They need the grace of God. And how will they see the grace of God if I lose my testimony? I need to do so in love. Amen. There's, a, there's, a, there's a whole slew of areas today that we, we, we need to understand and we need to know and we need to say, okay, I don't believe that. And you know something? Pastor Russ and I, we could come up here, we could set up a table, we could have a, uh, we could have a question and answer to the congregation. And I can guarantee that Pastor Russ and Pastor Randy is not going to see things eye to eye on every issue. We're not. He's going to understand Scripture one way, and I'm going to understand Scripture another way. But the bottom line is, are we willing to say, I believe this is what God has said, and I'm going to stand on the word of truth. And I'm willing to draw the line and say, listen, I don't care what man tells me to do. You know, I, I really believe there's a time coming when the government's going to require me, as a pastor, to submit my messages to them for review. I believe that. And you might say, well, that, that will never happen in America because of freedom of speech. It's already getting close to that. It's really it. You have to be careful how you say certain things. You have to be careful how you mention. You know, I, I am told, now I praise the Lord, I've been able to go into, in, up to Harrisburg and open, um, open the, the Senate in Harrisburg. Okay, two times in prayer. They've called me up and they've asked if I could come up and represent, you know, and, um, and, and I've been able to do that. And neither time have they said, you cannot mention the, the name of Jesus Christ. Neither time have they said that. I told my wife last time, I said, if they tell me that I cannot mention Jesus is Christ's name, I'm going to tell them I'm not interested in God. Because I represent Jesus Christ. I had, I had a family call me up and say, Pastor, I, I, I'd like you to do a funeral for us. I said, fine, I'll do a funeral for us. This is what I do. And, and they said, well, that, that's fine, but I want you to know something. I don't want you to refer to any scripture, and I don't want you to refer to Jesus Christ. Sorry, I can't do your funeral. Why? Because I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Okay? Will that cost something? Eventually it will. Why are we immune in this country from any other country in the world that gets persecuted for their faith? Only by the grace of God. I believe only because we as America have stood for Israel the way we have. And God's grace is still in America. But I can tell you this, God's grace is leaving America faster and faster every year. Praise the Lord for God's grace. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But you know something? He's gracious and he knows what he's doing. But I can tell you one thing. God tells us that we need to be willing to say, I'll draw this line and I will, I will cross it. You know, so the, so the, the, the question I think we need to ask then is what happens when we do disobey? What happens? Notice what the Word of God says. Look at verse 2. Okay, look at verse 2. Let me make sure I get my notes caught up here. When we, uh, when we disobey, look what it says in verse 2. It says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. What's that talking about? I tend to believe that, first of all, um, we're, um, we're told that if we disobey God, okay, 
we, um, we are opposing God's law. I think that's what it says right here. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I misunderstood this, but it says, therefore, who we, whoever resists the authority or government, okay, resists the commandments or the ordinance or the law of God. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. God says, listen, there's a consequences for disobeying. You know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong at this, but I tend to think that every one of our founding fathers who rebelled against England understood that there was a price to pay for their rebellion against England. I tend to think, and maybe I'm wrong at this, I tend to think that they tried every possible way to get freedom without rebellion. But when it came down, push come to shove, they rebelled. There was that revolution, we know, we know that. But there was a price they paid. In life, in material, in material goods, in, in, in you know, whatever, they were willing to pay that price. The Word of God tells us that when we resist, there is going to be a price that we're going to pay. Okay, and I, I really, I really see that. It's interesting in, in uh, Psalm Psalm 107, verses 10 and 11, it says this: Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron. I tend to think that's a picture of somebody who's in jail. Okay, bound in darkness, bound in uh, the shadow of death, with 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 irons on their arm and hands. Notice what the next verse says: Because they rebel against the Lord of God. Okay, we need to understand, we need to understand that the Word of God tells us that if we know to do good and not do it, it's sin. And whenever there's sin, there's a consequence to that sin. Now, now granted, well, what about if, the, if, if, if the, the authorities are sinning? Well, you know, Daniel was willing to follow the authorities as far as he could. Okay, and he was willing to say, "Sorry, I can't cross this line." What did that mean? That mean that meant he was thrown into lions' den. That means his friends were thrown into fiery furnace. But they were willing to do that for the sake of their God and their walk with God. And I think this is what we're being taught here: that when we do cross the line, remember there's a consequence. I remember years ago, I was just in ministry, and I, I didn't know how to respond to this. But I got, a, I got a letter in the mail. It's from a church out west. And I have no idea who, what church it is. I didn't keep the, keep the information. Um, but since then, I, I, I personally think the church was wrong. Okay? But this church wrote how they were being persecuted by the government. Why? Because they had a Christian school. And the government had come in and said, Listen, if you deal with kids, we want your teachers to be certified. The school said, no, we're not going to do that. We have no connection to the government. We're not going to do that. So the government said, fine. Then we're not going to, we're not going to grant you a, a, a tax exemption. You're not going to do it our way. You're not going to get tax exemption. So they wrote a letter to all the churches in America. We're being persecuted by our government because they're taking away our tax exemption because we won't do what they ask us to do, which is, which is not biblical. Well, sorry, that was totally wrong on the church's part. They weren't being persecuted. They were being, there were consequences to them saying no to the government. Now, you could say, well, that was persecution. That's fine. You can call it what you want. But we have to understand that when we take our stand, we can't not, we cannot, well, what's the term? We can't, uh, we can't enjoy both sides of the fence. We can't walk both sides of the road, whatever the expression is. Okay, we want what the world has to offer, but we say, okay, we're going to do it God's way. Wait a minute, you can't do that. And I think this is what we find here in America today. We as Christians have a responsibility to walk with the government if we can, but if we can't, we're going to follow God. And God has said and made it very clear, if I'm not mistaken, in Matthew chapter 5, in verses 10 through 12, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. For righteousness sake. Not because, you know, when you stand for what is right and you're persecuted and you, you go through struggles, praise God for that. Because God says, blessed are you who do that. 
And then in verse 11, it says, Blessed are you when you're reviled, persecuted. And, uh, and they say all kinds of evils against you falsely in my name. Or for my name. You know, good. Praise the Lord when, when that will happen. Listen, that, that happens very little in America. Yes, they're going to lie about us. And yes, they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to do things that, that, are, that, that probably, that we could say, okay. But you and I haven't experienced persecution the way that some of the churches in this world has experienced persecution. You read some of the countries in Africa, some of the countries in, 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 uh, in um in the Middle, Middle East, who have just gone through persecution after persecution. I forget how many, I was just told not too long ago, how, mil, how many thousands and thousands of Christians have been persecuted and killed by some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the Arab, you know, the, the, the jihad uh, Arabs who are walking through some of these countries in Africa and just killing the churches. Burning people alive and 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 raping the kid, the, the 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 wives and children and uh, you know and, and the, the the church the Christians are standing for their faith in spite of that we we have nothing of that but you know the word of God says blessed are you when you do right and you're persecuted okay we need to uh, we we need to comprehend that then in verse twelve it says rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven what a promise that is isn't it. God's going to reward you if you stand for Him. God has always rewarded us for standing with God. Okay, James chapter 4, I quoted this earlier, it tells us that if we know to do sin, and we don't do it. You know, there's a, there's a second thing. Look what it says. In, uh, look, look what it says. Not only are we, not, are we, um, if, we oppose God's, if we oppose God's law, it brings judgment to us in verse 2. But look what it says in verse 5. Okay, in verse 5 of chapter 13, it says this, Therefore, you must be subject, again, there's our word, not only because of wrath or because of judgment, but also because of conscience sake. Okay, when we, um, when, when we disobey God, okay, it's going to work out, it's going to work in our conscience. It's going to start eating us. It's going to start, you know, the, um, the, the word of God says, when you know to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. It's interesting in First Peter in First Timothy chapter chapter three four in verse two. This is a list where in the parallel days in the last days there's going to be there's going to be things that are going to happen. And it says this: speaking lies in hypocrisy. We're talking about those who do not know Jesus or those who are not walking with God. It says having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. How often do we allow the Holy Spirit to be grieved, to be quenched? And because of that, our conscience now is not guiding us the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done something wrong and, and you toss and turn all night long because you know you've done wrong and, and, and it's just bothering you? That's the Holy Spirit that's working in your heart. And, it, and you really don't have a peace until you, you get down on your knees and you say, Lord, I, I, I'm sorry, I've done wrong. And then you go out and you make it right with that person you've done wrong. That's, the, that's our conscience. The Word of God says, listen, when we disobey God, Okay, our conscience is going to be careful because our conscience can be seared if we don't confess that. See, we need to understand that there are consequences to that. Now, the the, the question, you know, we we've looked at, uh, we've looked at, we need to obey, and, and, and secondly, we need to establish. And I'm not going to look at how God appointed and God established and all those kind of things. Okay, but I think it's in, it's important for us to understand why God established government. Okay, God established government according to verse 3. Look what it says in verse 3. For the rulers are not terrors to do good works. Or are not a terror to good works, but to evil. In other words, government has been set up. Why? So that, so that good works can be done. Okay, they're, 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 they're set up so that we can work with one another and help one another and minister to one another. And government as a whole has been set up. Why? It goes on and it talks about this. It, it, it goes on in verse, uh, in verse, th in verse uh, uh, 3. It says, do, uh, do you not, or uh, sorry, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. How many of you... Have been have drive down the road and, and all of a sudden you see, right as you're passing the police car that's sitting on the side of the road, okay, you pass that police car and you look right away down at your speedometer. You go get that? Why? Because you know that the police officer's job is to what? Keep you doing what is right. 
Don't have to be afraid if you're doing right. right. I passed the police officer the other day and said, how fast were you going? I said, it doesn't matter. I was driving the speed limit. If he stops me, it'll be for something else, not for speeding. You know, we have to understand. We don't have to be afraid of the government if we're not going to do anything wrong. Okay, God set up the government so that we can understand that we can do good to, to do good and, re, and, re, and, re, and, re, and re, restrain evil. Okay, that's why God set up government so that good can be done. But also, there's a second reason so that we can contribute. And it's interesting here. The uh, uh, Paul writes and he says he talks about taxes, but I don't. You know, I I think that there's more to co the contribution we have to offer than paying taxes. Now look what it says there in verse 6. It says, it says for, uh, for because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are ministers attending continually to, uh, to everything. Render therefore um, to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And, and, and Paul's saying, listen, we have to be willing to give back to the government. And, and I tend to think, that you and I have to learn to say, okay, how can we, uh, how can we give back? Can I give you a couple, uh, couple things? I, I went on to the website for nationalization of American. You know, if you want to become national American, uh, an American, want to go through that process. There are five things every citizen should do. Number one, obey the law. Number two, pay taxes. Number three, respond to court orders. In other words, obey what the court said. Number four, attend school. Education is important, and America says education is mandatory. Number five, defend the country. President Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, said patriotism means. You know what patriotism is? I thought this was interesting. Patriotism means to stand by the country. It does not mean to stand by the president. I like that. You know, our responsibility is to say this is what God has given us as a country. And our responsibility is to contribute towards making America great. How do we make America great? You know, if you ask Kamala Harris or our Vice President Kamala Harris, she'll tell you one thing. If you ask former President Donald Trump, he'll tell you something else. You want me to tell you, do you want me to tell you what will make America great? Getting back on your knees and turning this country back to Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It's the only way to make America great. Okay? Why? Because the Word of God tells us we need to understand. God ordains these things. We need to be submissive to them. When we don't, there is punishment, there is consequence. But we need to do everything we can. Why? For the good of mankind. For the good of mankind. I think that's what this passage is talking about. Now, how does that apply? How can I, how can I apply that? Um, I think that's what, uh, yes. Uh, how can I apply that? How can I respond towards authority? So what is our response? I think there's three responses that I think, uh, three, I put two fingers up. There are three responses that I think need to be. Number one, Okay, I think the first response has to be we need to respect the leaders and the laws of the world. It starts with respect. You know the number one problem I find in America today is there's a lack of respect. There's a lack of respect from kids to parents. There's a lack of respect parents to authority. Where do the kids learn the lack of respect? They learn it from their parents. They do. Well, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to listen to what I'm telling you, and they, they, they watch you. You know, you tell them, hey, you have to be respectful, and then they watch you, and, and you know, you're you're online, and you don't like something our president does, and so what do you do? You send one of those those um, Facebook things out that talks about our president in a nasty way. But we have to respect those in authority. Wait a minute, that was just a lack of respect what you did. Okay, we we had that all the time. You know, there has to be respect. I, um, I remember growing up, it was always, yes, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am. 
Okay, and uh, and, and if we did, if we if we use the last name, it's never first name. I cringe when a when a kid comes up to me and calls me Randy. I cringe at that. Not you know, I, and, and you know something. I it's only a name. It really is. But I also think there's a lack of respect there. I know every person all the way out today is going to say, hey, Randy, hey, Randy, hey, Randy. Hey, Randy. Yeah. I, I get it, okay. Um, but, the, you know, it's, it's, you know I, I remember when I was in my first church, there was this, this, this school teacher. She was an older lady and, uh, you know, very proper. And, and you know, I always, I, in the church, wives was were equal, 101. I like to, like to call people by their first name. And I called her by her first name. She said, nope. She says, I am Mrs. or Miss so-and-so. Okay. And for the whole year that I was pastoring my first church, I had to call her Miss so and so. That was that was her way. As a school teacher, she demanded authority. She demanded that everywhere she went, that authority. Listen, there is a there is there is an authority that is missing. Okay, the word of God says, listen, the first thing we need to do is learn respect. And you know something? Somebody will come up to me and say, Pastor, respect is earned. I don't believe that hundred percent. I believe that sometimes. But you know something? Respect comes with authority. The office of presidency needs to be respected. I have a problem when I hear a newscaster called President Donald Trump, Donald Trump. He earned the respect by being our president. He earned the respect of former President Donald Trump. I really believe that. I believe that um, um, President Obama earned our respect because he was a president, former President Obama. Okay, regardless, it's not a first name basis. And we need to understand that God wants us to have respect towards one another. In, uh, in, in, in Titus chapter 3 and 1 and 2. It says this, remind them that are subject, uh, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no man, be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. That's what God says we need to be doing. And you know something? We lose that even talking about one another many times. Speak evil of no man. Is that how we live? Number two, okay, the second thing we need to do is we need to be active. We need to be active. God doesn't tell us to go by a mountaintop somewhere and live a secluded life, but he says, listen, you're part of the world, you live in the world, and you live in a world that's going to impact the world. What is our impact in the world? It's interesting in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 through 16. And we've studied this text and I'm just going to read it. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall we be seasoned? It is good, it is then good for nothing but to throw out the tramp on your foot. Okay, and then in verse 14 it says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light, um, make sure I have it on there, okay, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and then glorify God. That we may have an impact on society around us. How is your impact on society around us? I missed an opportunity this week. I'll have to admit that I missed an opportunity this week. The, uh, I got a phone call from the chaplain of Chester. Uh, Lisa somebody, I don't know her last name, I just know her as Lisa. She, uh, she texted me, she said, Pastor, we're having a thing on Thursday night, um, a thing in the city of Chester for, you know, I think it was to promote, you know, to promote unity uh, against, uh, against, you know, the, um, the, the, the guns and some of those other things that are taking place. Uh, okay, and she says, I, I want you, I'm, I'm asking if you would be interested in coming this Thursday night and opening our session or our, our time with prayer and sharing a little bit about why it's so important to have you And I thought to myself, man, what an opportunity to preach to a crowd 
that I don't know. They never had to have me back there that I could preach or crap. And then I looked at my schedule. And I said, there's no way I can put anything else in my schedule. I looked back and I said, you know, I should cancel what was on my schedule. And I should have gone and done that. Why? Because that has a greater impact in the community around me. I think sometimes we miss the, the, the opportunity of being active and being involved in our community because we're busy doing good things for God when we should be doing better things that he has set up for us. Well, God, I, you know, and, and I told her, I said, I, I'm really sorry I had a movie made today. I can't be there for the movie. I have to set up the projector. I have to, I have to run the movie night. I have to make sure the food is out. I have to do all that kind of thing. And, and, and last time she asked me to do something, it was on a movie night again. And I said yes, and I ran the whole time. I said, I'm never going to do this again. And, and it happened again. And you know something? Don't we miss out on those opportunities? God says, listen, you need to be a lighthouse to the world around you. You need to let your light shine. How do we do that? Stay informed and educated. Do you know, do you know what's going on in your community? You know what's going on in your neighborhood. You know what's going on. How many are, are you? Are, how many of you have, have really sat down and said, okay, this is what's happening and this is what, well, how I can be involved. Listen, I think we should have, you know, Chester school system has some problems. I think everybody here knows that. But do you know something? If more Christians would run on the, on, on the, uh, uh, on the school board, maybe we could solve some of the problems. Maybe. I'm not saying we could, but I'm saying maybe we should try. Maybe we should try saying, hey, the, the, the city of Chester has problems. Let's see how much we can be in City Hall praying with those who are, who are, who are officers down there. When's, th th does anybody here know the name of the mayor of the city of Chester? Our church is in Chester. Do you know who the mayor is? Have you prayed for him lately? I mean, these are things we need to be involved in, and these are things we need to be active about. Why? Because God tells us that that's what we need to be doing. If we're going to have an impact on the society around us. Listen, we're not a building that says, come into our building and get food and get clothes and, and, and enjoy a, a Sunday fellowship. And we're going to have fun here in church while we're here and then go out and do your own thing. No, the word of God says, take your light out into the world. And when we lose our flavor, when the salt loses its flavor, it's no good for anything but to be trampled underfoot of men. See, you and I need to understand that God wants us to be involved. He wants us to need to be active. We need to be informed. We need to be educated. Number two, we need to do what we can, what we, we can towards the good of other people. It's not about us. Look, look what I'm doing. God came, why? Not to be served, but to serve, to die on the cross for our sins. We need, how can we share the gospel with a community if we don't even out into the community? Is basically what I'm saying. You know, the word of God tells us, listen, we need to live in this community. And, and I'm not saying Chester. Some of you live in, you know, Springfield. And some of you live in Claymont. And some of you live in, you know, in, in, in <clears throat> Media. And some of you live in... Um, you know, Drexel Hill, and some of you live in Brookhaven, some of you live, you know, go and be involved where God has placed you. That's what God wants us to do. Why? So we can impact the world around us, so people can see our good works and say, wow, let me glorify the God of this, God, of this man or this woman or this family. Why? Because they're doing things that are pleasing. That's why God ordained government. And that's why he says, listen, be submissive and be subject to that government. Okay? Then there's a third thing we need to play. You know, there's a, there, there's a, I think before I go there, there's a third area in which we can be involved in. Okay? I think there's a responsibility we have to go out and build. I really believe that. I have not found anywhere in Scripture that says I need to go vote. I have gone on to the websites of all of the, the of all of the um, United States, as many United States, um, you know, websites that I can. Be careful going on there. Sometimes, you know, I got a, I got a virus as a result of going on one of them. So just be careful, okay? 
<coughs> but uh, I got on, you know, got on these these websites. Nowhere on the websites does it say it's a it's a uh, it's a duty of a, an American to vote. They always say it's a privilege to vote. It's a difference. There's no law that says we have to vote. There's some countries, I'm told Australia, you break the law if you don't vote. America, you can choose to vote, not, not to vote. But I'll tell you this, as Christians who are going to be informed and who are going to be active and who are going to seek the good of other people, we need to look at our candidates and we need to say, who's going to do the, good, the most good? Not for my wallet and not for me, but who's going to do the most good so that I can continue sharing the Word of God. God's Word. And to do that, you need to be informed. You, know, you need to know who they are. Because I can tell you things that, you know, that would scare you from both parties, by the way. But I, I, I tend to think that as you wrestle with this with God, you would say, hey, this candidate, if they get elected, will open the door for me to be able to have freedom to preach. Will open the door for me or for the Lord to have his way. Or this candidate, as they get elected, is going to move us further away from our relationship with Israel. Be careful of that. Because God says, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. Okay? We need to understand, and we need to look, and we need to say, listen, I'll tell you this. I don't like either candidate that's running. I'll be honest. Okay? I, I, I don't like either one. I think he, both of them have problems with it. But you know something? If you were to elect a new pastor, and I were to submit my candidate, my, my, uh, my, my doctrinal statement, and I would say, hey, I want to be your pastor, you can look at me and you can find all kinds of different problems with me and freedom as well. Why? Because I'm a sinner saved by grace. You know, it's, it's, it's where they stand in some of the policies that are important. And my friends, we need to be active in, in voting. But there's a third thing we need to do. And uh, that, that is we need to pray. See, we need to respect, we need to be active, and we need to be praying. The Word of God makes it very clear. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayer, intercession, and uh, giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice that for everybody. And then uh, notice, notice what it says right here. Right here on verse 2. For kings and all who are in authority. The Word of God says, listen, we need to be praying for those who are in authority. When's the last time? I already asked that question about the mayor of Chester, but when's the last time you prayed for your senator? When's the last time you prayed for your representative? When's the last time you prayed for uh, President Biden? When's the last time you prayed for Vice President Kamala Harris? When's the last time you prayed, uh, you know, I mean, take, take our officers. Take those who are in authority. Take the, you know, the, 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 the kings and those in authority. And notice what it says. It says, when you do that, that you may, may lead a, peace, a, uh, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Listen, my friends. You know, we need to understand it's not about, it's, it's, it, it's about what Jesus tells us to do. There's a, uh, there's a Bible verse I want to end with. And, um, you know, I, it, it's found in Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, you're in chapter 13, so if you want to go over to Romans chapter 8, you may. But in Romans chapter 8, in verse 35, it says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slow. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. My friends, we need to understand that our victory comes when you and I are willing to say, it's not about what I think, it's not about what I want, it's about what Jesus Christ wants. And I'm going to do it His way. In Romans chapter 13, God gives us quite a list of things. He says, listen, be subject to authority. Because I've placed them there. Are you willing to be subject to authority? Let's close with a word of prayer.
Father, Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for uh, your word. And Lord, I pray that we would learn to be active. We would learn to be, you know, it doesn't matter. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not persecution, not famine, not anything that man can throw at us. But Lord, we know that we as your children need to step out by faith. We need to be obedient to you. And we need to do what you call us to do. And so Lord, you go before us. You minister to us. You help us, even through this election. Maybe there's some here who said, hey, I, I've never vote, voted, and I, I'm not even registered. But Lord, they have time to do that. They have time to get involved. They have time to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get educated. They have time to be active. Lord, help us to impact our society. Why? We don't do it for our own good. We do it for you. Because we have victory in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, give us that victory. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing our last song uh, here together. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. Let's stand together and sing. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to have an impact on those around us. In all that we say and all that we do, help us to give you the honor and the glory. We do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.